did. What was nice to be described as a, a former on news night. That's politics for you. It's a bit like a travel circus. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, which is why it's always a great pleasure to come to the old club and speak to real people. Um, rather than sitting in the House of Commons as we did this week, listening to two and a half hours of what was no more than an anti Scottish hate fest. Yeah, there was a couple of Tories turned up in their tartan ties to talk about how their great grandfather was in the Argyles, they were the devils in kilts, and therefore you jobs need to know your place because that alone is enough for them to remain in charge of our country. What errant nonsense in every single regard. But that was the tame version of what we normally hear. I mean, let's just think about what it is our opponents say. Dismantle their arguments as part of our case. <coughs> too small, too poor, too stupid. Welfare dependent, public sector dependent, subsidy junkies, the oil is going to run out. Even if you listen to Alistair Darling, you might think the oil has already run out. But then this is the man who a few years ago forecast six billion in revenue. It actually came in at 11 and a half, almost doubled. That was a nice new windfall for the UK Treasury. But of course that would never happen with independence. Oil would only decrease in value in Scotland if you listen to these people. Now, oil's only a small component of our economy. It's not the biggest single power, but it's important. We'll say a few words later. Let's just go through the, what they say. They say we are public sector dependent. There are two and a half million people employed in Scotland. Two and a half million. In 341,000 companies. 77% of them work in the private sector. It's actually the highest private sector ratio on record. It's higher than in the third quarter of 1999. Why is that important? After 18 years of Tory government and two years of new labour, we still have a higher private sector work rate than we did even then. Now I'm not going to argue ever that's the right proportion. There may be a good argument to have more in the private sector or more in the public sector. The point I'm making is when our opponents say the public sector dependent is simply isn't true and that's important. They then say you're welfare dependent. You're some backward little place all dependent on state handouts. Uh, something for nothing society is how they portray us. We spend 14% or so of GDP on pensions and benefits. The UK spends 16%. We're not welfare dependent. We're in a better place to fund our obligations to people who need that help in the future. And you'll hear a bunch of other stuff. The IFS, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, will tell us our population will age on a 50-year forecast. Imagine trying to judge Scotland in 2014, in 1964, when most people didn't have a telephone line. When there was two channels on the TV and half the population didn't have one. Oil hadn't been discovered. The internet hadn't been invented. Everything was in black and white, including attitudes. <laughs> <laughs> They're asking us to believe their figures looking 50 years into the future. The Berlin Wall had only just gone up, let alone come down. But they are able to see that distance in the future and say, uniquely, Scotland will not survive. <coughs> We're not welfare dependent. We're in a better place to fund our obligations. And we will fund our obligations better to those who need that help. I'll talk about the oil now because I always find this bizarre. <coughs> the UK government agreed there are 23 billion barrels of oil and gas left. There are higher estimates, by the way. There's one up to 33 billion barrels of extractable oil and gas. It's valued at about 1.5 trillion pounds. But that's really not the important figure. The important figure is the tax revenue. <coughs> PwC have said, uh, just a year or so ago, with the correct investment and the stability, that will generate 400 billion pounds of new tax revenue. 400 billion. The UK have taken 325 billion so far. The case for independence, which is normal, 
goes a bit like this. They may have wasted the first 325 billion of our oil wealth. I'd rather we didn't let them waste the next 400 billion of our oil wealth because there are good uses we can put it to that don't include weapons of mass destruction. But the biggest myth uh, of all is the subsidy myth. You're subsidised. You couldn't have survived without us, says the man whose granddad was the colonel in chief of the Cameron weapons. What absolute nonsense. Last year, with 8.4% population, we generated 9.9% of the taxes, but took only 9.3% of the spending. We're not subsidised. That was a relative surplus to the UK of around £4 billion. Pounds. The same over the last five years, and we've had one current account surplus, the UK's had five deficits. That means in the last five years, Scotland was £12.5 billion pounds better off than the UK outcome. So that's £2,500 <coughs> per person we could have invested and had the same economic outcome, outcome as the UK. And none of this should surprise us. Over the last 32 years, the figures have been the same. <coughs> we have averaged, man, woman and child, over £1,300 in tax, more than the UK average, every year for 32 years. Every single year. And when you look at the big picture, the big picture, on average, over the same period, Scotland actually ran a surplus. Modest 0.2% GDP. A surplus, on average, for over three decades. The UK ran a deficit, on average, of 3.2%. Trend growth is only 2.5%. If anyone's bankrupt, if anyone's bust, if anyone is not viable, it isn't Scotland. And if there is a subsidy or a net fiscal transfer, as they call it in the trade, it does not flow from London to Scotland, it flows from Scotland into George Osborne's treasury. It has done for decade after decade after decade, so that this rich nation is not as rich a society as it should be. And I'm going to end there with one final argument. Having failed to make the case on the technical argument, Having failed to explain they are too poor, too small, too stupid, they fall back on even weaker arguments. And my favourite one goes like this. They will say, unionists will say, and I've heard it said, we have never seen an argument or a problem to which independence is the answer. Not a single problem to which independence is the answer. Not even the democratic deficit, but we'll put that aside unless we want to comment on that. What does that really mean? It means that 18 years of Tory government, 18 years of Thatcher and Major were okay, 18 years that we watched industries dismantled before our eyes <coughs> were a price worth paying for Tony Blair and an illegal war in Iraq. I don't think there are very many people in this room who would agree with that. But that's where we end up. This is as good as it gets. Tory governments who have not been elected in Scotland since 1955 are allowed to run roughshod over the people of this nation and that's fine so long as the union is protected. Friends, I know we're saying yes, but frankly I say no. That's not good enough. It was never good enough. And we give ourselves the opportunity this September to finally nail that argument once and for all to deliver independence and more importantly the resources of this nation for the people of this nation to turn a rich country into a rich society to turn potential into profit profit into prosperity and that prosperity with a purpose to look after all 5.3 million of us who live in Scotland I should have started off by apologising for not being Sean Robinson. I'm afraid she's got to go to Edinburgh. I hope that was helpful. I look forward to hearing the other speakers and taking the questions. So thank you very much indeed.